thanks so much, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. It's interesting, actually, my lab is just at the EBRS. There's a chronobiology school in LMU, which I realize is also in Munich. So I was actually only Googling this morning how close is TUM to L LMU. So I was getting a little bit of understanding about, about um, universities in Germany. So let's just hope. So I'm going to talk to you today. Sorry, I just need to click this. I do. I'm, is everything OK, Anna? Yeah. Yep, I'm going to speak to you today about clocks. So we have, you know, as a species, we've been really interested in clocks for a long time. And back in, you know, historic times, we would wear this very fashionable sundial around our neck to understand the time of day. Um, if you were of a certain vintage, as I am, you will remember this uh, Coldplay and they had a song about clocks. And actually from where I'm from, which is Dublin, well, Ireland, uh, we even have clocks to tell the time when it's time to go for a pint. But the clock that I'm going to speak to you about today is our bi biological clock, our body clock. And the reason we have this is because we don't live in a constant environment. We live in a very 24 hour environment. And that's predicated by the fact that we're on this um, uh, a spinning uh, rock that spins every 24 hours and, and the sun stays in the one location. So we actually need some sort of a mechanism to allow us. Can you see my pointer, Anna? Yep, we need some mechanism to allow us to um, anticipate and to respond to this very predictable 24 hour cycle. And we do that mainly through light and light then um, causes changes in the back of our eye, specialized cells in the back of our eye, and signals to the area of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, <clears throat> or the SCN. And the SCN is considered, or is considered, the master clock. But about 20 years ago or so, it was realized that there wasn't just this clock in the brain. Oh, oh no, sorry. My, uh, I've had this problem before, Ada, so I'm, I'm worried. Hold on. OK, let me go again. Can you see us? Yeah, now it's uh, presenter mode. Presenter mode. I hope uh, I'm going to. So the SCN clock, um, we thought for a long time that the main clock was in the SCN, but now we realize that actually there's clocks throughout the whole body. So, you know, probably in every organ and um, within the body, there is um, there are cells which have this timing mechanism. So indeed, light is certainly the dominant side keeper or time giver um, it, in terms of our body's physiology, but also feeding is also another very important side keeper in terms of entraining these peripheral clocks, the ones that lie outside of the SCN. So how is this clock um, comprised? Well, it's comprised of a number of transcriptional translational feedback loops. And I'm really going to focus a lot on this area. So BMAL and clock are, are, may, are um, helix hoop, loop helix transcription factors, and they drive expression of core clock genes, including period and cryptochrome. So what happens is BMAL and clock, they're very active at the beginning of the light cycle, and they start driving expression of these genes, period and cryptochrome. But as the day continues, period and cryptochrome, as they're translated, then can shuttle back into the nucleus and actually repress the activity of BMAL1 and clock. And because then BMAL1 and clock no longer has that repressive effect, the cycle starts again again and that happens every 24 hours. <clears throat> now it's not as simple as that there's a number of ancillary loops as well reverb alpha or or dbp and nfil3 and these ancillary loops really ensure the you know, very accurate timing of this system. And if we ask ourselves, well, you know, what's the characteristic of a circadian rhythm? It's it's very clear what it has to do. It has to peak and trough within 24 hours. And, you know, from studies now in the last couple of years, we've realized that there is just a huge amount of circadian control across our body. So we know now that, you know, almost 50 percent of our protein coding genes are cycling somewhere in the body. And that would actually make the circadian system the largest regulatory network in normal physiology. But I would say it's not studied as much as, as it should be. Would you agree, Anna? I think you probably would. So if we think about what the body clock ensures, well, it really ensures correct timed alignment between the light and dark, the activity and rest, and the feeding and fasting. But modern life is definitely causing circadian rhythm disruption. And the reason that this is happening is that the two dominant zeitgeepers, which I mentioned, light and food, 
are now mistimed. So we spend the majority of our time indoors in very low lighting. We, we have a very erratic light exposure. Hands up who checks their phone before they go to bed at night. Come on, don't be shy. And then we can really eat at any time of day or night. And um, again, so that, you know, feeding is such a strong zykeeper. Um, and really our body clocks anticipate us only feeding through the, the light cycle. And really in the blink of an evolutionary eye, we've gone from a species like this, that was th that our activity and our behaviors were completely predicated on the rising and the setting of the sun to a species like this, in which, you know, we have very much divorced ourselves from this ex external um, environment that, that we are programmed to be so aligned to. And circadian ry rhythm misalignment can cause many diseases. So in the young, childhood obesity, irritability, in middle age, heart disease, depression, and then in, in later age, then a number of other conditions. And when I look at this, you know, what really stands out to me is that a number of these conditions are chronic inflammatory conditions. And, you know, with myself, with my immunology hat on, I find this really interesting. And circadian rhythms, you know, exist also in the in symptoms of inflammatory disease. And this is one thing that I think is just super interesting to, to note is that, you know, some inflammatory diseases, nocturnal asthma really peaks in the middle of the night, rheumatoid arthritis, their symptoms get much worse in the morning. You're much more likely to have a cardiovascular event first thing in the morning even more likely first thing on a Monday morning and the most likely to have it first thing on a Monday morning after the clocks spring forward for daylight savings time. And that's one of the reasons why we should stop this ridiculous um, practice of switching our clocks in spring. And we've just done it. I don't know. It's the same with you as well in Europe. We've ju we just done, did it the last weekend. And, you know, these symptoms are changing according to time of day because the immune parameters that underpin these symptoms are changing according to time of day. So, for example, room rheumatoid arthritis, those symptoms peak because there's actually an increase in IL-6 in the early morning hours that's driving those symptoms. And for me, what was really interesting is that I, 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 I realized that both cells of the innate and the immune and the adaptive immune system have a molecular clock. So for those of you who are not you know, that familiar with, with immunology, you know, the innate immune cells are dendritic cells, macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, microglia, but then the adaptive then are our T cells, B cells, and NK cells and mast cells. But all of them contain some sort of a timing mechanism, although it can be slightly different what that timing mechanism does between these cells. And if you remember, I was talking about that TTFL, the transcription translation or transcriptional translational feedback loop. And what I was saying to you, you know, the main factors are clock and BMAL. And BMAL one, we use this a lot as a tool because basically it is very much the master regulator. And if you knock BMAL one out, you know, that can provide you with a model of circadian disruption. There is no um, reports that other things are still cycling in the absence of BMAL1. But if we just think about the transcriptional translational feedback loop and you look at it with and without BMAL1, it looks very different. So without BMAL1, these are the red lines. What you see is, you know, very straight lines on some of these core clock genes, period one, period two, cry to reverb alpha, DBP, which under normal conditions have these really nice circadian variations. So I'm really interested in macrophages. And, and the reason I'm really interested in macrophages is because they're like, they're the chameleons of the immune system. You know, they really, they can change. They, they display enormous plasticity. And when we sort of look at the kind of polar ends of these macrophages, we, talk, we can classify them as M1 macrophages or M2 macrophages. And that's a very simplistic uh, um, classification, but it's useful to provide a framework for, for, for studies. But what we do know is these macrophages come in all shape, in all colors, um, like a spectrum. But if we look at, if we think about M1 macrophages, they are very pro-inflammatory. You know, their function is um, against microbes and also tumor. And, and in a way, if, if they're overactivated, they promote tissue damage. At the other side of the coin, then you have your M2 macrophages and they have anti-inflammatory activity. They, they come in after the inflammation, they gobble up the debris, they have high phagocytosis capacity, and they're really good at tissue regeneration and repair. And, and other things. But unfortunately, they are very much involved in, in tumor formation. And if we look actually at, um, sorry, if we look at the different clock factors and we look at 
how they affect different cytokines because that's what macrophages really do you know every immune cell kind of has its key function and macrophages key function is is production of cytokines and if you look now at the different cytokines that are regulated by these clock factors what you can clearly see is most clock factors are involved in negative regulation of these cytokines but really interestingly clock is actually um is actually a positive regulator of a number of cytokines. So you have two transcription factors which bind together. One is driving inflammation, that's clock, and then the other one is kind of retarding, restraining inflammation, that's BMAL1. But I suppose if we think about chronic inflammatory diseases, we have to remember that genetic variants are not cutting the mustard here. There's, there's no way that genetic variants are explaining the really big increase that we now see in many chronic inflammatory diseases. Our genes have not changed, okay? But what has changed is our environment, our behavior, and our diet. And what we've realized now is, and I don't know, does anyone remember this movie, Thelma Louise? <laughs> Great movie. But the reason I put this up here is to, is to make the point that what we think now is that it's actually not genes that are driving these changes, it's metabolism. So metabolism is likely the driver of these changes. And then the genes are just in the passenger seat responding to metabolism. And that's all we sort of come to appreciate over the last um, number of years. So really, if we want to understand chronic inflammatory diseases, maybe we shouldn't look at gene expression or genetic variation. Maybe we should actually look at metabolism. And, and one of the biggest sensors and adapters of our environment, our behavior and diet, all of these three things which are changing, which are probably the reason why we're seeing such an epidemic of chronic inflammatory diseases, is our body clock. Now, in the last 10 years as well, that's been linked to metabolism. It's been clear now, there's actually been a bit of a revolution in the immunology field. It's been really clear now that cellular metabolism within immune cells is what's driving their function. So we now know that we'll say, for example, with an M1 macrophage, it has a very distinct metabolic signature. And one of the key things is very high glycolysis, okay? And it's actually quite, when you look at its metabolism, it's actually quite anabolic metabolism. It's, it's making a lot of stuff because it needs to make, you know, a lot of cytokines. If you look at an M2 macrophage, its metabolism looks different. It's quite catabolic metabolism. It's breaking down stuff like fatty acid oxidation. So of course, thinking now about you know, metabolism being linked to chronic inflammatory disease, but now metabolism being really linked in terms of immune cell function. Um, and sorry, I should have said us immunologists, like we became immunologists because we didn't like biochemistry, but now we actually have to, you know, dust off the biochemistry books um, and actually learn some of these metabolic pathways. So, so that's why, you know, it's difficult for some of us to do it. But really, you know, all of these ideas then have come together and, and really formed what I consider this new field that we call circadian immunometabolism. And really what it's about is understanding the linkages between circadian biology, immune function and metabolism. So the first study that I'm, our first bit of data that I'm going to show you is one of the things we asked ourselves was, well, okay, so you're talking, Annie, about macrophages being important, but is the macrophage cellular metabolism circadian? Like the metabolism that's going on within that cell, is that circadian? And to answer this, this was a study that was led not by me, but by Jennifer Hurley in RPI in the USA, who's a collaborator of mine, a super individual. What she did was, and, and what we did together was, we decided to serum shocked cells because this allows us to look at clock function in vitro this is a system that was brought that was developed you know over 20 years ago but basically in your cell culture system what you normally have is lots of your cells each have their own clock but they're all at the same at different times of day okay so you never really see big clock effects in cell culture because they're in an unsynchronized state but you can do a, a thing that we call serum shock you put on for two hours and what you get that oh Sorry, this is, it was too much. Hold on. I'll go back. We will get through this. It's, it must be a glitch in my, uh, uh, oh, let me actually. If you put a uh, serum on cells for two hours, um, can you see this now? And I'll just swap, will I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it might be maybe the graphics. 
what you have is you have a synchronized culture system. So it allows you to actually look at time of day, oh, time of day effects. Um, I'll try one more time, then I might have to. It allows you to look at, sorry about this, Anna. There's always something, isn't there? There's always something. Exactly, yeah. Try it um, again and maybe if if it doesn't, maybe it's one of the slides, you know, the graphics. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to go straight to uh, to this. Yeah. Can you see this now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what we did was we used the Serum Shock and that allows us to um, basically synchronize the cells so we can look at time of day effects. And what Jane did was, you know, she's a systems biology. I'm a very reductionist scientist. I'm one protein, one assay. So, you know, I like to do Western blots, but Jen likes to do the whole proteomic analysis. So what Jen wanted to do was to look at the transcriptome and the proteome in our cycling cells every two hours over 48 hours. So it was a, you know, a massive experiment and also like really expensive. So, so Jen did that, but what we found, which was really interesting is that lots of the, um, lots of the uh, metabolic um, pathways are cycling, okay, in these macrophages. And what we then added to the story was, we use a seahorse machine, so it's an Agilent, it's from Agilent, it's just a very expensive machine that allows you to look at oxygen consumption, so how your mitochondria are respiring, and also lactic acid, which is basically a readout of glycolysis. So when we looked at the seahorse machine, we were also able to see that these macrophages functionally were very much changing their metabolism depending on time of day. So what you see here is OCAR, so that's your mitochondrial respiration, high, low, high, and then your ATP-linked OCAR as well, high, low high depending on time of day and all 12 hours apart so really nice circadian rhythms there in metabolism and then so the next question that we asked was okay so if metabolism is cycling in our macrophages well what happens to the metabolism of a macrophage that doesn't have the clock such as a bmal1 knockout macrophage and how might this impact the response to inflammatory stimulus such as lipopolysaccharide so lipopolysaccharide is a component of gram negative bacteria and i'm sort of I came from the laboratory of Luke O'Neill and he's addicted to putting LPS on immune cells. And so now I'm addicted to do, doing that as well. But it's just a really strong immune stimulant and it causes um, upregulation of a number of different um, uh, pathways that leads to cyt cytokine expression. So we looked at that and what we found is that BMAL1 macrophages are actually really hungry for glucose. So we can look at this. And as I said, I, this is my kind of science, one protein, one Western blot. So what we can see is that macrophages that lack BMAL1, they have really high expression of GLUT1, the, gl the glucose transporter that's mainly expressed in macrophages. And as well as that, we can do glucose uptake assays. And what we see there, the knockouts are in red. What we can see, see there is the, the BMAL knockout macrophages, they just love to take up glucose. So, and it kind of reminds me when I saw this data, it sort of reminded me, and Anna, you might appreciate this as well if you think about sleep. You know, when you're sleep deprived, okay, the last thing that you look for the next day is, you know, an apple or a banana. Like you crave carbohydrates, like you crave glucose. And I, this is what these um, macrophages are like when they have circadian disruption they crave glucose and we also could show that the glycolysis so how glucose was metabolized was also really high in these knockouts and that's really interesting because if you remember what I was saying to you this revolution now in immunometabolism that's kind of hit the immunology field by storm one of the key differences between an M1 macrophage and an M2 macrophage is glycolysis. An M1 macrophage is really going to ramp up glycolysis. So macrophages that lack BMAL1 are, they're like supercharged M1 macrophages. That's how I consider them. They're like, they're, they're hyper metabolic. Now, I'm not going to go into this paper too much because it's been published if, you, if you'd like to look at it, but this is just a summary of the things that we found. So what we found is in a macrophage that lacks BMAL1, high levels of glucose uptake. We also showed that they had high levels of this um, glycolytic enzyme called PKM2. Now, PKM2 is in the glycolytic pathway, but it also has a moonlighting function. It also goes into the nucleus. And we showed that there was more of that happening in a macrophage lacking BMAL1. There was more PKM2 going into the nucleus. And one of its roles is to phosphorylate STAT3. And also at the, at the other side of things, when we looked at the mitochondria, we also saw, saw that in 
macrophages that lack BMAL1, those mitochondria are also like hypermetabolic. There's actually more mitochondrial respiration going on, but that's also leading to increased levels of these immunometabolites, which are coming out from the mitochondria, succinate being a key one. And this succinate actually drives increased reactive oxygen species, which actually stabilizes another transcription factor called HIF. And it's both, it's the combination of HIF active HIF and phosphostat 3 that's causing a much larger increase in IL-1 beta in these, um, in these macrophages lacking BMAL1. So, so that was the first thing. So that's when the clock is bad, okay? Or not having a clock is bad. The next talk, part of the talk that I want to discuss with you is this new data. And this is all about circadian ma medicine. It's all about making the most of our body clocks. And a lovely article came out in the New York Times uh, during the summer, which really detailed this and, fo and followed some of the really key circadian researchers across the world, including John Hoganush, who's, who's really done a lot um, in this field. And the way I think about circadian medicine or chronotherapy it's all about, it's not just what you take, it's not just what the medicine you take, but it's actually all about when you take it. And we got interested in this because in 2016, there was a study that showed that flu jabs, like flu, the flu vaccine was more effective in the morning. And we thought this was really interesting. And what they found was that if you vaccinated actually older individuals in the morning versus in the afternoon, those that were vaccinated in the morning, if you followed them up a couple of weeks later and you looked at their antibody response, they had a higher antibody response. To me, this is just really interesting because it's a really easy way to boost vaccine efficiency, right? It's to really under understand the time of day that might be the most appropriate for the vaccine that you're given. And so we then asked ourselves, is the clock within dendritic cells responsible for time of day responses to vaccinations? And if so, how? And if 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 you're not an immunologist or if, if you don't remember your immunology 101 from your undergrad, dendritic cells are also part of the innate immune system. They're kind of first cousins of macrophages. So whereas macrophages are really great at producing cytokines, the key function of dendritic cells is to present antigen to T cells and to mount the adaptive immune response. And this is work that was done by Mariana Cervantes and, and Richie Carl, who have since left my lab. So as I said, dendritic cells, they're fantastic at taking up antigen, processing it and presenting it to T cells. So this is your antigen. So this could be what, you know, whatever antigen you're thinking could be even the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. They take it up, they process it, they chop it into bits, and then they present it on either MHC class one or mainly MHC class two, sometimes MHC class one. That allows then T cells, which have a T cell specific receptor to that antigen to bind to those dendritic cells. And that interaction causes clonal expansion of T cells. So it, it, it allows T cells to rapidly expand. So we were trying to figure out, OK, we need some sort of in vivo model that allows us to kind of to really just home in just on what the DCs are doing, because a, a paper about two years before us had shown that the T cells have a clock and that they're very important for vaccine response. So we wanted to separate that out. We spent a lot of time trying to think about what might be the best experiment and we came up with this. So what we did was we took mice and we actually adoptively transferred in T cells. So these are CT, they're stain, stain T cells and they are OT2 T, T cells. So they basically have the T cell receptor that's specific to the antigen that we're going to use, which is ovipeptide, which is just a model antigen that us immunologists are, are use a lot because we have lots of tools to, to, to look at it. Okay. So on day minus one, we put these into the, the mice. Then a couple of hours later, oh, sorry, sorry, we isolated these from the mice. And then a couple of hours later, we took separate mice that had been entrained either to, to two different times of day using a cabinet, using a, a circadian-like cabinet. So and I have to say, this took a lot of explanation to the reviewers of our paper, because it's a really hard thing if you're not used to it to actually explain. So, so these mites were coming out, and they were coming out of the cabinet when they were at ZT7, which is seven hours after the lights go on or ZT19, which is 19 hours after the lights go on, but the lights will go off at ZT12 because, you know, it's 12 hours light and dark in a mouse facility. And if it's not, if you, if you don't have that, you might be in trouble in your mouse facility. So make sure you do. Um, and then, tw so what we did was we put those um, cells in and then the next day, then we immunized the mice. 
And then we, uh, three days later, we harvested the um, lymph nodes and we looked at T-cell proliferation. So the way we kind of view this is this would allow us to sort of specifically look at the DCs because the T-cells were the same from, the, from one animal going into two, the two animals that were entrained into the two different times a day. And what we found is if you immunize mice at ZT7, that produces a much greater T cell response than those immunized at ZT19. So this is just the PBS controls. And what you're looking for here is this is a um, flow cytometry, fax plot. And what you're looking at here is T cell proliferation. So here, these are our CTV T cells with PBS. They do not proliferate. But if you look at the animals that um, got our CTV cells, what you can see is even CT19, ZT19 immunization, they do proliferate, but they actually pro proliferate a lot more if the immunizations happen at ZT7. And we can quantify this. So ZT7, which is, you know, about one o'clock in the day, it's sort of in the middle of the mouse's rest phase, seems to be a really good time to immunize mice. And we could also see this by CD69 staining, which is just a marker for T cell activation. So then we wanted to understand why this was. And we went back to our serum shock model and we did this in BOMAR derived DCs. So what we looked at is antigen processing. And there's a really cool tool that you can look at antigen processing called DQOVA. And basically what it does is it's a quaint substrate normally, but if it gets processed, if you chop up your antigen, it fluoresces. Okay, so it allows us to look at antigen processing within cells um, across the time of day. And what we found was that DCs process antigen much greater at dawn than dusk. OK, so you can see much higher antigen processing here, not a lot here. But then in a BMAL knockout, they're not processing antigen that well at all. And when we did the quantifications of this, what you can see is that in a wild type dendritic cell, you get this beautiful circadian rhythm of antigen processing. But in a BMAL knockout, it's just a flat line. So, so there's no rhythms there in antigen processing. We also then wanted to see if this was happening actually in vivo. So we did an ex vivo assay where we took out CD11B or CD11C splenic DCs. And again, we looked at our antigen processing with this DQOVA substrate. And what we could see is that, yes, it was changing according to time of day. It was actually low at ZT7 and started to increase as we went up to ZT ZT19. And we can talk about why we think that's happening, how that um, correlates with the in vivo data in a second. But if we looked at a dendritic cell that didn't have BMAL1, the DQOVA uh, processing was less. So then we were trying to rack our, rack our brains and we're like, OK, what is generating this rhythm in antigen processing? And we thought the mitochondria were probably going to be important. So what we did was we looked at antigen processing in the presence of mitochondrial inhibitors. So this is DQ over processing or antigen processing. But if you add oligomycin, which is an ATP synthase inhibitor, or FCCP, which basically uncobbles the membrane potential of the mitochondria, what you can see is a drastic reduction in antigen processing. And then our BMAL knockouts had less antigen processing, as we had said before, but you also see this a similar reduction. And then really the proof of the pudding here is not just antigen processing, but it's T cell activation. And we can do these co-cultures where we take our DCs and we put in our OT2 T cells. These are very specific for, for OVA. And we can look to see what happens. in. And if you do that and add OVA, you get um, lots of interferon gamma because your proliferating T cells are producing more interferon gamma. But if you add oligomycin or FCCP, again, you can block that. So we were then kind of scratching our heads and thinking, OK, what are the publications that are linking circadian function to mitochondrial dynamics and mitochondrial um, dynamics and, and, and immune? Sorry, what are we found these publications linking circadian function to mitochondrial dynamics? And you might ask yourself, well, well, what is mitochondrial dynamics? So mitochondrial dynamics is basically the fact that mitochondria is this um, video working, Anna? Yeah, so mitochondria are not, you know, when I was in, when I was, you know, in un undergrad, oh, that's that, <laughs> there's the problem. Um, when I was in undergrad back in the medieval times, um, you know, we were told that like mitochondria were these peanut shaped organelles and, you know, they basically just floated around the cytoplasm. We now know that that's not the case. They're like highly dynamic and they basically can form networks or become fragmented um, depending on what's going on in the cell. So I'm not even going to try to show that video, but I hope you hope you got to see a little bit of that video just to uh, 
to whet your appetite. So what we can see with mitochondrial is they can form these really long networks, which is mitochondrial fusion, or they can like fragment into like little the peanuts, which we were told that's what mitochondria constantly look like, um, depending on what they need to do. And depending on the morphology, that dictates their metabolism. So if you have an elongated mitochondria, they're really good at doing what mitochondria is supposed to be doing, oxfos, ATP. But if you have a fragmented mitochondria, then you have a reduction in oxfos and, and ATP. And what we could see is that the morphology in these dendritic cells was changing with time of day. So at dawn, the morphology of our dendritic cells was much more fused, much more elongated, whereas at dusk, it was like real punctate. But in a BMAL knockout, it was punctate no matter what time of day. And then we did a lot. So we quantified that. So you can see this really nice circadian rhythm and mitochondrial fusion. And I should say this had been seen in other cells. Cells. So it had been seen in fibroblasts and it had been seen in liver cells as well, that there's this circadian variation in infusion and fission. And we also showed then that metabolism was circadian, you know, under this was under this was underpinning circadian metabolism. So oxygen consumption was cycling in the wild types, flat in the BMAL knockouts. Same with ATP production and then membrane potential was also cycling in the wild types and flat in the knockouts. And I just want to say here, because, you know, I often think when people and especially for early career researchers, when they see data or, or like when they see talks and they think, oh, my God, I'm not doing enough or, you know, my stuff isn't working quick enough. I can tell you now, this slide took us two years to do. So the data on this slide took two years. So, you know, this is not a this is not a quick and easy uh, career that we're in. It's, you know, you have to be in for the long game. So just just know that. So because I often think I know when I was an early career researcher, I used to look at talks and think, mother of God, like what's wrong with me? You know, nothing, because <laughs> nothing worked for me in my PhD for about three years. Um, so the next question that we had is, could we rescue this deficit? Or, you know, could we change, if we change the mitochondrial morphology pharmacologically, could we change anti antigen processing? And we were lucky that there was actually a compound that we could use called Medivy. Medivy inhibits this really key mitochondrial fission factor called DRP1. So basically, we asked ourselves, OK, if we use DRP, can we actually change the phenotype of a dusk um, dendritic cell, which is not which is not um, processing antigen very well or a BMAL knockout? And of course, I wouldn't be saying this to you if, if it didn't happen. So what we can see is in a dawn dendritic cell, you know, they're in fusion and they're processing antigen, as you can see from the immunofluorescence. But at dusk, they're in fission. And they're not, but we can drive fusion in those cells by adding Medivy. And when we do that, we increase my, our antigen processing. And we can do the same in a BMAL knockout. So a BMAL knockout, they're in fission no matter what time of day. So they're fragmented no matter what time of day. And again, if we use Medivy, we can drive um, mitochondrial fusion and we can increase um, antigen processing. And this is just the quantification of that. So then we wanted to see, OK, well, what's what's regulating this? And, you know, this took us a long time as well to figure out. And we looked at about cytosolic calcium because cytosolic calcium activates calcineurin and that signals for DRP to go to the mitochondria. So DRP, when it's, it's got this um, phosphorylation site on serine 616, is normally in fission. So it allows DRP to go to the mitochondria and basically chop up the mitochondria. OK, but then there's this kind of opposing signal on DRP, which is phospho um, 637. And if that's if that serine is phosphorylated, that basically um, inhibits 616 and you end up getting more fusion. So we kind of thought that that's kind of neat, you know, and if I was a clock, if I was a circadian mechanism, I might use this, you know what I mean, to, to change fission and fusion by time of day. So what happens, where, where does cytosolic calcium come into it? So cytosolic calcium activates calcineurin and that dephosphorylates at 637. So you end up just with 616 and then you end up with fission. So we asked ourselves, well, is calcium changing according to time of day? specifically cytosolic calcium and mitochondrial calcium. And indeed, that's the case. So what we see is in a dend dendritic cell, if you look at mitochondrial calcium, it's changing with time of day. At the time of day, when you actually get more antigen processing, you have high mitochondrial calcium. 
and the time of day that you get less mitochondrial or sorry antigen processing you get higher cytosolic calcium but the bmal knockouts they don't change irrespective of time of day but interestingly enough they have higher cytosolic calcium and that would be driving this increased vision and um, that we see can we manipulate calcineurin we can with a compound called fk506 and if we do that, then what we do is we basically dry fusion, right? As you can see here, this is elongated mitochondria, and we can affect antigen processing. We can increase antigen processing in, B, in a BMAL knockout, and we can increase antigen processing at dusk as well in a wild type. I'm just, I'm thinking of time, but I want to make sure we've got, have I got like another three or four minutes, Anna? Yep. So then we were kind of saying, okay, how is this happening? There's this cycling of, of calcium between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. What might be affecting this? And no one really knew how calcium was going into the mitochondria until about maybe 10 years ago, until they found, they discovered this um, mitochondrial calcium uniporter called MCU. And that basically brings our calcium you know, from either the cytoplasm or from the endoplasmic reticulum into the mitochondria. So we kind of thought mm, that that might be that might be what's happening. Oh, sorry. And what we found is that so when we take splenic DCs over the course of the 24 hours, what we could see is, yes, BMAL was cycling and PAR2 was cycling as it should be. But some of the, the gene expressions of the components of this mitochondrial calcium uniporter were also cycling. So that kind of said, mm, that's interesting. All right. And then the last thing I think we did was we inhibited this mitochondrial um, calcium uniporter by a compound called ruthenium red. And indeed, what we were able to do is when we did that, we were able to bring down mitochondrial calcium, as you would expect with the ruthenium red. But actually, we were also able to um, decrease antigen processing, OK, both in the Y types and in the knockouts. And again, the proof of the pudding for us is always T cell activation. So also when we did our co-cultures of our DCs with our um, T cells that were specific for the OT2 receptor, we could also bring that down with ruthenium red. So basically what we've been able to show is that in a DC, certainly the clock is controlling antigen processing by affecting mitochondrial morphology. So there is one, there is a certain time of day when the mitochondria in a dendritic cell are more likely to be fused, more likely to be taken up mitochondrial calcium, and that allows antigen processing to occur. If you don't have a clock or at, a, at probably the opposing time of day, what's happening is the mitochondria are more in, in a fragmented state, and that just doesn't allow antigen processing to occur. Now, I would have to say is we haven't licked this completely. What we, what we couldn't figure out was what's been released from the mitochondria that's really affecting antigen processing. We thought it was ATP. It doesn't look like it is. So that's an unanswered question. So if any of you want to take on this challenge, I think, you know, trying to understand what is being released from the mitochondria to, to really drive antigen processing will be the next key step. And if we could actually find that, you know, that could maybe be some sort of a vaccine adjuvant as well that 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 we could we could use. But certainly, you know, we are looking into the prospect that Medivi, which drives anti our mitochondrial fusion, whether we can look at that when whether we can use that as sort of a, a vaccine adjuvant. So basically what I've what I've hoped I've showed you is that, well, first of all, the circadian clock is really important in innate immune cells. And when it functions properly, what you have is appropriate immune metabolism, a controlled inflammatory response, lower incident of chronic inflammatory diseases. We see this across a number of animal models, enhanced DC function and, pro and enhanced vaccine immune response. When it does not function properly, when it is impaired, what you get is this massive immunometabolic rewi rewiring. So the, the cells become really glucose hungry. They really re rewire their metabolism. That really changes the inflammation, becomes very dysregulated. You have a higher incidence of chronic inflammatory disease, not just work that we've done, but there's lots of other people who've now, who've now shown this. You've impaired DC function as well and probably impaired vaccine immune response, which again, you know, points to the fact of, you know, why it's difficult to, to get robust vaccine um, a vaccine response, say in elderly individuals or even individuals who are obese.
So with that, this is an old clock slide, which I was trying to change just as Anna was introducing me. So if anyone from my lab ever looks at this talk, I'm sorry, this was an old slide. I didn't have everyone in here who contributed to the study, but I'd just like to thank all our collaborators and our funders, but specific for this talk, Kingston Mills and, and David Finley's lab in Trinity have been immense. Nick Jones and Emma Vincent's lab really helped um, with the immune and metabolism stuff in macrophages. And then I just would like to thank you for your attention. And this is the beautiful city of Dublin um, by day and by night. So if you have haven't been here make sure you get over here it's good crack okay thanks Anna thank you so much Annie that was just fantastic um so much enthusiasm uh, enthusiasm coming from your side and just congratulations to this amazing work I mean um, we've seen how much how much time it takes um so yeah thank will you I very end much. the show because I'm, I'm afraid this thing is going to click crank again so will yeah I, stop I think sharing? you figured out the problem yeah <laughs> Um, so uh, thanks also for the participants. Do you have any questions? If so, put them in the chat. You can also unmute yourself um, and um, and uh, yeah, turn your video on. And while this is happening, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've written down a number of questions here, Annie. <laughs> and actually, you you made me understand some of the things because I'm not an immunologist at all. I have no idea. But um, just maybe let's start with. Um, so you've shown this really fascinating uh, finding that um, vaccinations, of course, um, you know, as, as, as you said, don't have the same effect depending on time of day. How, how big is that effect size though? Do, you, do we really care about this or is it like, yeah, we, I mean, yeah, it's nice. I mean, it, we could improve it, but actually, you know, it's, it doesn't matter that much. Well, I think, you know, like certainly when we started the study, vaccines weren't as in vogue as they are now. Um, and I think, you know, what we've re really realized is that certainly, you know, a small increase in vaccine efficiency can have a big effect, you know, especially when it comes to pandemics. But as well as that, like even in terms of, we'll say, trying to vaccinate the elderly with the flu vaccine, you know, even a small increase Now we, we haven't figured out, you know, how this would translate into the clinic. But if we did, if we look at um, some of the work that's been done, yes, there is, it's not a huge effect, but it is, a, it is an effect and it's an effect that can be achieved cheaply. And so that's sort of the way I look at it. Now, I would say, I don't think every vaccine will have the same, will be, will want to, to, will work if most efficiently at the same time. So a number of like, so we can see now with the flu vaccine, it's probably early morning. The um, SARS-CoV-2, the mRNA vaccines, that kind of looks like it's it's early afternoon. Now that could be a very different mechanism of action because obviously with those mRNA vaccines, it's probably all about transcription and or, or it's all about translational effects, you know, ribosomal biogenesis and, and all of that. So I just think it's, it's interesting to figure out about the time of day. But the other thing that I would sort of, the way I would look at it is, it's not just about the time of day. If we can figure out the appropriate time of day, we have an understanding of things that could actually enhance it pharmacologically. So for example, now that we know that mitochondrial fusion is important for DCs in terms of their antigen processing, you know, can we use something like Medivy then as a vaccine adjuvant, you know, at any time of day? Mm -hmm. So understanding how this beautiful cir circadian system works kind of reveals to us certain mechanisms that we can try to target. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, what complicates the situation that we haven't even talked about individual differences, maybe mm. chronotype differences that play a role here. And of course, um, sleep deprivation or, you know, having a good night's sleep beforehand that obviously influences um, all of this as well. Absolutely. And like I would say, like even in the trials and, and they've been, you know, the trials that have been done up to date, you know, they've been small numbers. You know, I think there's really and there should be an effort like what would be if I was an epidemiologist, you know, what would be a great study? And I'm sure there's people who, who are doing this at the moment is, you know, like we've had one of the biggest vaccine immunizations ever. So could we can we look at those responses? Can we look at chronotype? Can we look at, you know, sleep scores? Can we look at time of day of vaccinations there? And, and, and what are the, you know, what are the trends that we can see from that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So before I go to the two questions in the chat, I just want to ask another one of mine, actually, since I have the chance now. So um, you so you showed us the effects um, with the different mice when they uh, were uh, taken out at CT7 versus CT19. And um, I mean, the, the protocol is always the same. You always have this 20, uh, sorry, um, 12 uh, 
12-12 cycle. Um, do you think we could actually, so, you know, with human research, when we want to look at um, circennial stuff, it just takes forever to do this kind of research, right? So do you think it, um, it could, we could simulate this with animals by just changing this 12-12 cycle somehow and then study, do it, like do your study exactly again, but change this a little bit. So we simulate like shorter, shorter days, like in winter. Yeah, I don't would sort annual stuff. Yeah, I don't I don't know how that would play out. Um, and certainly, yeah, for 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 us, like we're we're just mainly interested in circadian variation, not circannual. Like, are you saying seasonal differences? Then mm -hmm. is it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. But like, we do know that the immune system changes with season. And what's interesting, if mm -hmm. we even just think about that, female one expression changes in it across the seasons. In that, like, it's lower actually. You know, during the winter months. So mm -hmm. again. I suppose, you know, could some of that like feed into um, I suppose public health measures as well, you know, for when we even vaccinate as well? Should we be vaccinating even for the flu a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. you know, to 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 get that that potentially greater response? Exactly, so, yeah, yeah. I I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. OK, right. So we have two questions in the chat, one from uh, Julia Julusova. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, how does the serum shock reset the circadian clock? Would physiologically relevant changes in nutrient availability have a similar effect on immune cells? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So it's, the first thing is with the serum shock, um, what happens is when you put on and there's a serum response factor within cells, and when you put this like high concentration of serum, what happens is you get this like massive increase in period expression, the negative regulators, and then they dropped at the say, you know. They, their, sync, their drop is synchronized and that sort of like just resets the cycle. So that, that's how you get this synchronization across all, all the cells and glucocorticoids are, are, are responsible there as well because you can actually do the serum shock not just with 50% serum, you can do it with dexamethasone as well. And there's actually a couple of things off the shelf that you can take and use as a, as a serum sort of inducer. One thing you can't use is lipopolysaccharide. We've tried that. We tried, we thought we could kind of like do an inflammatory shock with LPS and, and that doesn't work. So, but, and then the second thing, yeah, the nutrient avail availability is, um, I think, that could really be affecting your cells as well. Like, so there's there's studies now done from Dave Finley's lab, who's just down the road from us, showing that like, if you basically starve, you know, your dendritic cells, you can get a different response. And that's that's happening through um, ER stress. So I think, you know, are you asking if the nutrient availability could actually affect circadian rhythms? I think it, it definitely will. And that would definitely happen in vivo. But in terms of in, in your culture systems as well, yes, I do think nutrients would have a, a really big effect. Okay. Um, then we have another question from Alan Zhuang. Fascinating talk. Thank you, Annie. Do you see the circadian regulated mitochondrial function and other immune cells which may contribute to vaccine outcomes as well? Yeah, so we've just, thanks, Alan, um, and hi. Um, so we've just um, we've just done it in DCs and we've done it in, in macrophages as well. So we see this change in mitochondria, and, and that's what, in, in the paper with Jen, with Jen Hurley, we also saw this change in fusion and fission um, in the macrophages with time of day. But we haven't looked, like we haven't looked at the adaptive immune cells, which I think would be really interesting, especially because there was a paper by, um, Oh, um, Pierce, I'm, I'm forgetting her first name, which really showed that the state of the mitochondria really determined uh, T cell function. So, you know, T effector cells looked very different in terms of the mitochondria to T memory cells. Like I think T memory cells had, you know, fused mitochondria, whereas your T effector cells had very fizzed mitochondria. So I think that would be a great thing to look at in some of the adaptive immune cells as well. My feeling is, Alan, and I don't know what you think, but my feeling is, you know, we've seen this change in mitochondrial morphology now in, you know, macrophages and DCs and other people have seen it in fibroblasts and, and liver cells. And um, my feeling is that this is probably a very universal um, mechanism which the clock uses to control both metabolism but also you know that particular cell's function as well so I I have a feeling that this is just a, a broad mechanism that the clock uses okay thank you for that 
Um, so still feel free to put some more questions in. Um, and otherwise, I have another one for you, Annie. Um, so uh, maybe an annoying one. <laughs> I'm just I'm just interested. So um, do you actually did you only use um, uh, male mice or do you actually test differences between uh, sexes as well? Yeah. So in, in this study, we just use males. And, you know, I would really love really love to look at this in females because interestingly enough you can females it's easier to vaccinate females than it is males you see so okay. females have a higher vaccine response mm -hmm. and, but that's and that's the reason why I think females are more susceptible to autoimmune disease as well you see so it would be really lovely to see mm -hmm. if there was a, a sex effect on this we kind of thought we saw a bit of a sex effect when we looked at um when we did the seahorse analysis, like when we looked at oxidative um, consumption and stuff, but it's it's too early to tell. But yes, I would, I think, looking at the intersection between, you know, sex and circadian rhythms, because circadian rhythms are different depending on sex. So to see if that is impacting on immune function as well, I think would be a, a great grant to write, actually, and get funding for. Yeah, it's just another layer of complexity, right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. Right. Um, so I think there's no other question in the chat. So I will um, stop with a more sort of philosophical one or sort of hypothetical one for you, Annie. Um, so, we, you know, we are always talking about how bad our environment is now and, you know, it's okay in disruption and misalignment and so on. I'm just always wondering, you know, how long might it take for us to adapt to this situation, right? I mean, we, there are epigenetic effects and, and so on. So do you think, maybe we just we just should carry on like this because we can't do much anyway so so at eventually in some generations you know we we might have adapted to it I, but i just don't think we do we can't adapt to it you know so it's like <laughs> um are you saying that like that that the genetic marks will just build up and build up you know generation over generation mm -hmm. You know that is a tough question for me, Anna. Um, and I don't like like to me. I just I just don't think so because mm -hmm. I always think about the fact that like electricity has only been around for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know this what what we've experienced in the last hundred years is just a drop in the ocean in considering how long we've been on this planet. Um, so I think if we are going to adapt, it's going to take us a heck of a long time to adapt. And yeah. I say, you know, the rate we're going with climate change and all of that, we may not, you know, that that we, day we may might not be there seen. anymore, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, let's hope. No, I, I'm I'm very hopeful for that. But um, yeah. But, but but yeah, like this is I I just think you know when you see just how pervasive the circadian rhythms are in every mm. system in the body and how important they seem to be and um, it's very hard and the fact that if we look at you know a, um, expression control by the clock like we're looking at nearly half of our genes somewhere in the body are cycling now of course there's there's lots of data now that's coming out that's saying you know that a, a gene um cycling at mRNA level doesn't always give to a protein cycling, but still there's huge amount of control by the clock. Um, and, and so I think when, when you look at that, it, I think it would just be very hard for us as an organism to, to adapt. Well, this just shows the urgency again, then that we have to change something about this and address it. So with this, um, Annie, thank you so much for your time and your enthusiasm, your research. And um, I thank all the participants for being here today. Um, I will stop the recording now. You can find it on our website um, afterwards. And um, yeah, so thank you very much again and uh, see you next time then maybe.